What's going on guys, Ben Brewster here at Trend Athletics and today we're going to be breaking down Edwin Diaz's mechanics. We're going to go over how he's able to throw 100 plus miles an hour consistently and we're also going to go over why he's been absolutely dominant this year even compared to in the past several years. First, if you're not already subscribed to this channel, we release several videos every single week discussing pitching, discussing how to maximize your ability as a pitcher, as a thrower, or as a coach of pitchers. So again, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and do that right now. Give this video a thumbs up and let's dive in. So a quick overview on Edwin Diaz before we dive into the breakdown. He's listed at 6'3", 165 pounds. Now, I know he's a thin, kind of wiry, lean guy, but there's no way, my opinion at least, that he's 165 pounds. I was able to find video of him from when he first got signed and he was in the minor leagues, and he looks way skinnier than he is today. So I would be willing to bet that that 165 pound number was probably when he was first signed. He's probably more in that 185, 190 pound range. Still very lean, still very wiry, very long limbs, very long levers. But again, really impressed with what he's been able to do. My hunch is that he's been able to add 20, 25 pounds since being signed. As far as just how dominant he's been this year, looking at the stats just makes it even more impressive. He was ranked first this year in Ks per nine, striking out 17 batters per nine innings, a FIP of under one, ranked first in strikeout percentage at over over 50% of batters that he faced, he was able to strike out. The next highest was 40%. So just a massive gap between his strikeout rate and everybody else in the league. With percentage, also over 50%. And then some expected stats, expected Woba and expected ERA, also ranked first in the league. And then if we looked at some of his percentiles, fastball velo, 99th percentile, extension, 99th percentile, chase rate, 97th percentile, average exit velo, 96th percentile, K percentage, 100th percentile, expected batting average, just about everything you can look at from this savant overview on his metrics is very, very top of the league. So pretty much without a doubt, one of the best relievers in baseball, if not the best reliever in baseball. So just really cool to be able to watch what he's done to this point in the year. So let's dive into his arsenal a little bit and just kind of do that overview before we look into how he actually moves on the mound to produce some of these outrageous velos and outrageous results. He's primarily a fastball slider guy, and historically he's thrown the fastball a majority of the time. This year he actually switched to throwing the slider a majority of the time. So we start with the fastball. He's throwing that fastball about 42% of the time. He's averaging almost 99 miles an hour with it with an effective velocity here of 100.7 miles an hour. Now effective velocity, essentially the same as perceived velocity. This takes into account extension. This takes into account basically how close to the plate he's releasing the ball and so even though it's 99 it actually looks like 101 this is that's his average fastball if we look at what he's been able to top out at he topped out at 102.8 miles an hour this year the effective velocity of that particular pitch was 103.8 miles an hour so he's throwing super hard but it also actually looks like another tick or two harder than it even is simply because of how much extension he's able to create, how far off the rubber, how far out in front he's able to release that ball from a very funky slot as well. If you look at the actual kind of movement profile on his fastball, right, this is probably the only area with his fastball that isn't kind of outlier or unique in some way, shape or form. So he has pretty standard movement profile on the fastball. So not a ton of vertical break, not a ton of arm side movement. It's pretty average in terms of the actual movement profile. But again, everything else we look at with the fastball is an outlier in some sort of other characteristic. So we go down the list, but the next step would be a vertical approach angle. So essentially the steepness of the pitch after ball release to where it crosses the plate. So we think of where, the, where it crosses the plate and where he releases the ball, the angle of that. So a lower vertical approach angle would be a more steep, a more downhill plane. A flatter vertical approach angle or a higher vertical approach angle number would be more of that uphill plane holding a flatter plane on its way to the plate. And so again, we can obviously decipher from this that he has a very high vertical approach angle. He's releasing that ball from a very, very low release at a very low slot. And he's throwing a lot of his fastballs up in the zone. And so this is able to create this extreme rising effect, kind of like how a Craig Kimbrell or a Josh Hader or even a Jacob deGrom are able to get a similar types of outcomes on some of their fastballs as a result of creating this rising effect. So he's ranked at uh, fifth in the league from vertical approach angle at negative 3.74. So again, outlier from that characteristic, we touched on extension, but his extension is also towards the top of the league at over seven feet. He's releasing that ball over seven feet in front of the rubber, 7.31. And again, that makes the fastball look even more fast, even less reaction time than hitters already have, even if he was releasing from a foot further back. Release height is four foot 10. So he's releasing from an extremely low release height. This makes him an extreme outlier, extremely funky when you compare him to some of these other hard throwing pitchers like a Helsley or a Jordan Hicks, a Clay homes or some of these guys where they're able to generate this type of velocity but from a much higher release height so it makes him significantly funkier than those guys just having that unique release height piece of the equation as well if we look at his progression over time basically we can see that just about every year since 2016 his release height has dropped so it was 5.3 in 2016 to 5.2 in 2018 to 4.9 to now in 2022 4.8 so 
it's not uncommon for pitchers slots to kind of creep in one direction over time, right? Josh Hader is an example of a guy whose slot has been creeping up slightly over the past several years. His slot has been creeping down Diaz slightly over the last several years. And so we can see the relationship there with vertical approach angle. As his slot drops, his vertical approach angle has gone up. Obviously a flatter plane as his slot drops, a steeper downhill plane as his slot was higher in the past. And it's one of those things where there's not necessarily a better or worse. It comes down to figuring out what's the optimal for each pitcher. We see with the actual movement he's able to create on the fastball that he actually was able to create a little bit more rising effect from the actual spin, from the actual vertical break number on the fastball when he had a higher slot. Why? Because he had a slightly higher axis and he was releasing the ball on the higher axis and he able to create a little bit more vertical break. From a lower slot, he's a little bit more on the side of the ball and he's not able to create that nearly as much, but he's having a little bit of a flatter plane. So there's trade-offs between high slot, low slot, and it's figuring out where for each specific pitcher they perform best and they get the best outcomes on that pitch. So there's always gonna be trade-offs with any pitch. But now let's take a look at his slider. And so you're probably wondering, well, you just went on about how amazing his fastball is. That's gotta be his best pitch, right? No, that's by far and away not his best pitch. His slider is actually his best pitch, which thank God he's actually started throwing that the majority of the time because for a long period of time, you know, pitchers just kind of relied on their fastballs because that's what they thought they were supposed to do. They had the most comfort with the fastball. But in a lot of cases, when a pitcher has a great off-speed pitch, really, if you think about it, there's no reason they shouldn't be throwing their best pitch the majority of the time. And so that really has been kind of the theme and trend over the past several years in the big leagues where these analytics departments are starting to realize that and pitchers are throwing their best pitch more, even if it means throwing far, far fewer fastballs as an overall a percent utilization of their arsenal. So he's throwing his slider 58% of the time this year and averaging almost 91 miles an hour with it. Uh, what's interesting here is that this really does have, for me, a, a pretty close comp to Jacob deGrom's slider. The actual raw movement on it, it's more of a gyro slider. It's more of a straight kind of downhill slider, not a ton of sweep, very firm. But because of that, it's able to come out of the hand looking exactly like a fastball. And so hitters are really guessing because it looks identical halfway to the plate and then that slider kind of just dives out of the way. So what he's doing is he's playing off the vertical separation between the gyro slider and the four seam fastball. So his four seam is able to stay up in the zone, stay on plane. And because he's throwing that with 13, 14 inches of vertical break and two inches of vertical break, something like that on the slider, he's able to create this very late 10, 12, 14 inches of separation between where the hitter thinks that fastball is gonna go. And it turns out to be a slider and they end up swinging directly over top of it. So he's playing the vertical separation game. He's not really playing that kind of the lateral game as someone who maybe throws a hard running two seamer and a kind of more sweepy slider might be playing the, the horizontal separation game. So I'm curious personally, if I got a chance to ask him this, uh, if he picked up any tips on his slider actually from DeGrom, uh, simply because they really utilize their fastballs and their sliders in a very similar way. And again, throw that very firm gyro slider. Just going back to how dominant he's been with the slider, his extra base hit percentage on the slider this year was 0.6%. Now we actually look back and say, well, okay, how many extra base hits did he let up on the slider for it to be a 0.6% extra base hit percentage? And the answer is one. Yes, he let up one extra base hit all year on the slider. Compare this to the MLB average of 7%, right? 7% extra base hit percent on the, on the average MLB slider. And that's just completely outrageous. He's not giving up any damage on the slider all year. If he wants to make sure it's either an out, it's pretty much gonna be a strikeout or it's gonna be a single worst case scenario if he goes to the slider. You can see why he began to have much more success throwing that slider a majority of the time. If we look at uh, run value for the slider, uh, run value is a way to kind of compare across different pitchers across the league, you know, which pitches actually perform better over time. His slider ranks as the best slider for a reliever unsurprisingly at negative 22 run value. And then again, we look at the utilization of his slider really ticking up in 2022. And I, I think this is, uh, this is such low hanging fruit for a lot of pitchers. When Kyle Wright initially came to us and we were trying to examine, you know, why, why is he not having success at the minor league level, at the big league level? What's exactly going on here? The curveball was ranking out as his best pitch on paper and by outcomes, and he was throwing it a minority of the time. And that simple tweak of throwing his curveball over two times more often and really being able to lean on it and go to his best pitch more often was one of the most important changes that he was able to make to turn into who he is this year as a 21 game winner. And so it's cool to see Edwin Diaz, really same story, um, you know, able to begin going to that pitch more. He was throwing it 34.9% of the time in 2021 to throwing it almost twice as much 
this year at 58% of the time. Now it's worth noting in isolation, right? If he only threw sliders and he didn't have this 100 mile an hour fastball in his back pocket, hitters could start to cheat the slider a little bit. They wouldn't have to respect it as much. So it's worth noting that even though he's throwing this pitch a majority of the time, just having that velo available to him, having the fastball available to him is gonna force hitters to respect that slider a lot more. All right, so now what you guys came here for, which is to compare how his mechanics have changed over time and again, how he's able to throw so hard. So I think to understand how and why he throws, how he does currently, we need to be able to rewind the clock and look at how he's thrown over the course of his career. So uh, one of our coaches actually put out a thread a while back examining his mechanics from 2016 through 2022. Uh, and so again, that's where this initial kind of idea and comparison came from. So I'm gonna go ahead and link to that thread down below. But one of the things that I noticed just going through this and, and kind of comparing, uh, first and foremost, uh, among a number of other things is his first move. So if we look at the initial leg lift and we look at the height of the leg lift, this is a pretty stark difference. So we're gonna peak leg lift right here. Let's look at him in 2016. Hands below the letters, knee, knee and leg lift height, roughly waist height. And we can see over time that leg lift, the hand position has begun to rise to the letters, to the neck, and to this year, again, lifting the leg above the letters and bringing his hands all the way up to kind of eye level. So over time, his leg lift has just kind of been getting higher and higher and higher and higher. This reminds me in particular of Nolan Ryan because Nolan Ryan, when people would ask him, how are you able to throw hard? What are you thinking about? What are you trying to do? One of the common answers that he would give is I'm trying to lift my leg as high as I can. When I lift my leg higher, I throw harder. And so for him, that was a cue that was able to encourage him to just get that aggressive forward move, keep everything synced up. And he just noticed when he lifted his leg higher, he threw harder. So I'm just curious where he got that idea from or if he just kind of naturally happened over time as a result of his body organizing itself, just trying to throw the crap out of the ball, trying to attack hitters. But really interesting that the first move has gotten to be a much higher leg lift. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that the tempo of his leg lift has actually gotten slower. So there are some coaches out there and some people out there that kind of subscribe to this idea of everything has to be as fast as possible down the mound. There's certainly some truth to that for certain guys where if you're way too slow, Speeding up the tempo can absolutely allow everything to sync up in a better position, less energy kind of being lost, being bled as a response to just being too slow, right? If we're trying to go and do a vertical jump and we pause for too long at the bottom of that jump, we're not gonna jump as high. But there's also a flip side where being 100% way too fast, you're also not giving your lower half time to actually build and get you into good positions and fully have a linear move and unload and, and transfer the energy up into the upper half. So there's a reason that hard throwing pitchers fall into kind of a, a tempo range. There's a reason they're not all just slide stepping, no load into the lower half, no leg lift, and those are the guys that throw the hardest. They're not. It's the guys that can find that sweet spot of tempo. And so for him, he's actually gone from, according to kind of, uh, we were able to kind of hand time looking at these, uh, about a 1-4 to the plate, 1-4 to 1-5 to the plate, to closer to a 1-6 to 1-7 to the plate. So you can see he's really taking his time, letting the leg lift build and then accelerating from there versus before it was kind of just quick from the start all the way through the delivery. So this brings up a number of different uh, things. I can already tell that any sort of high school, old school high school coach watching this or college coach watching this who really preaches like you have to be a one, two to the plate, you have to be one, three to the plate. It probably drives them crazy to see the best, you know, closer in baseball with a one, six, one, seven to the plate. And they're probably gonna say, well, He's Edwin Diaz, so he can do what he wants. My perspective is when we look at ideal timing to the plate, ideal tempo to the plate, we need to look at it in the totality. We can't just say an absolute, everyone has to be a one, two to the plate because some guys don't have a lot of comfort with a slide step, with a super, super quick leg lift. They actually, there are some gives and takes there. So if you're able to dominate with a one, six to the plate and can't throw strikes and struggle and throw three miles an hour slower being a one, three to the plate, Right, that's a conversation to have. That's, some, that's a decision to make. I will say, looking at the number of base runners and number of stolen bases allowed, he did allow about four more stolen bases this year compared to 2016. So when guys did get on, when they had the chance, they ran at a slightly higher rate and they were successful eight out of 10 times as far as stolen bases. However, his VLO was up, his numbers across the board were improved, his extra base hit percentage was cut in half, and overall he let far fewer runners reach second or third base or get extra base hits than in 2016. So again, it just calls into question the need for everybody everywhere to have to be a one-two to the plate when the best closer in baseball is a one-six, one-seven to the plate. 
So finding the ideal tempo, the sweet spot for you, there's other ways to hold runners besides having to be a one, two to the plate, even though that is ideal, if you can be a one, two, one, three to the plate, but varying holds, uh, varying looks, uh, pitch outs, there's other ways to hold runners if you find that you're just a much, much better version of yourself, letting your lower half build a little bit longer. The next thing to point out that really, really stood out to me was how deep he was getting into his hinge before versus now. And what I mean by hinge is again, that posture and that sit into the back leg, coming out of leg lift, how deep was he getting into that position now versus before? So we kind of play through this as, again, we talked about the leg lift, a much higher leg lift right now, a little bit more upright torso posture during the leg lift. But we get to that point where he's in that kind of maximum sit position in the back leg. And we look at how deep and we look at that posture in the back leg now versus then. He's sitting significantly deeper into that hinge, significantly deeper into that backside. And so again, significant difference from before. Again, just like with everything, this is on a spectrum. Some guys will do better being a little bit more of a tall upright posture, a little bit more of a shallower hinge. Whereas other guys, again, this is, comes down to experimenting and finding what works best for you. We'll do better by having a more forward torso posture and sitting and holding a deeper position in that backside and a deeper hinge. And so again, I think it's, it's pretty clear and safe to say that for him, uh, this is a more advantageous position to hit. Again, we can see right here, again, how upright he is versus holding a more hunched over position right there. It's also important to realize that this is kind of the critical moment. The posture and the position of the hinge coming out of leg lift is going to determine a lot of what else is gonna happen later on in the throw. So the posture that we're able to sit into and find coming down out of leg lift is going to determine ultimately the slot that we deliver the arm through and the slot that the kind of the trunk, uh, trunk delivers the arm through. So when he's in kind of this more hunched over posture, typically what we're gonna see from that position is we're gonna see the pelvis rotate in more of an anteriorly tipped position and the torso is gonna, get, gonna follow what the pelvis is doing. And so the torso is typically gonna deliver the arm in a lower plane if you get into that more hunched over position out of leg lift. When you stay more upright throughout the leg lift, a little bit less, a little bit more shallow of a hinge, and you stay in this position and rotate from here, the pelvis is going to rotate in more of a posteriorly tipped upright position. The trunk is gonna rotate in line, and you're gonna see the arm delivered in a little bit of a higher slot. So this position right here, when we see that slot and that release height dropping over time, this is ultimately why that slot is dropping over time. It's the posture coming down out of leg lift that determines everything else and determines how everything unwinds from that point forward. The next thing that I noticed was his glove arm. So if we look at the position of the glove arm at really the same part of the throw, right about here. You can see how much higher the glove arm is 2016 versus now. Now, he's always been a guy who holds a ton of internal rotation tension on the glove arm. But what I mean by that is he's really turning over, pronating and internally rotating the glove arm, using that as kind of a way to hold the glove side closed. So when you're able to hold this tensional feeling right there where everything is just totally wound up, it's borderline impossible to open up early with the front side. Whereas when a lot of guys, their first move is here, they're, they're, they're throwing their glove arm just turns over early, it pulls the front side open. So one strategy he's kind of always used is really turning the glove arm over, creating this internal rotation, rotation tension, holding everything closed, staying upright, and then unleashing that at the very last second. He's not doing that nearly as much. He still has a little bit of that. But what I see is the glove arm was kind of matching the torso posture before. Now it's still matching the torso posture. He's just in a more hunched over, deeper hinge position versus before. But he's, he's calmed down just a little bit with that degree of turning that glove arm over. He's calmed down on it a little bit. What I still see is that glove arm is more or less matching the posture that his pelvis and trunk are putting him into. So a little bit of a change there with the glove arm. And again, you can see because of how much more forward he is, this throwing arm is now a little bit further back as well. So again, if he was here before, he's here now. Throwing arm goes a little bit further back, glove arm goes a little bit further forward and a little bit less high at this point in his delivery. So the next part we can talk about is pelvic load. This is really what I would consider his secret sauce, what makes him different, what makes him special, where he gets a lot of his power from. Now, most pitchers get their power from that pelvic loading and unloading, but he does it in kind of a really funky outlier way 
where he's really, really able to hold that closed, coiled off pelvic position very, very long down the mound. I mean, he's just an absolute bazooka right here in terms of how he moves his body. He's extremely dynamic, drifting, catching the back leg, sitting into the hinge, and then unloading everything at the last second. So what I mean by the hinge, by the uh, pelvic coil, is when he gets to this position right here, this is what I would consider a very internal rotation dominant uh, hinge position. So if you've been following this channel for any amount of time, you're kind of aware we all have different like hip anatomy, hip structure. Some of us are, you know, perform better in hip internal rotation. Some of us perform better, have more room, more stability in our hips in external rotation. Uh, Edwin Diaz, very, very, very clear example of a guy with extremely good hip internal rotation. That's kind of his bias. That's where his body favors uh, producing force, producing uh, rotational torque. So for him, in this case, this is kind of a, a comfortable position for him. For somebody else with a different hip structure, different hip anatomy, they're not gonna be able to get into this type of position because they don't have, you know, 45 degrees of hip internal rotation on that lead leg. Um, what's interesting to see here, this is what I would consider a pelvic driven uh, internal rotation. So this might not look like he's in internal rotation. You might say, well, that lead leg clearly is, but the back leg looks like he's, he's not but we need to factor in where the pelvis is. So this foot again is even with the rubber, but where's his pelvis? His pelvis is turned way over top of that back leg. So his pelvis is actually facing all the way back here. His pelvis is facing the shortstop. And so this back hip is actually in relative hip internal rotation. And again, that lead hip is in internal rotation as well. So he's creating a crazy coil in hip IR on both the back hip in closed chain and the front hip in open chain, if that makes sense. And so what he's able to do, he's holding the pelvis closed, he's holding it closed, he's holding it closed, he's creating a crazy amount of coil through the spring, crazy amount of coil through his hips, through his pelvis, through his lower half. He's holding that down the mound, down the mound, down the mound, down the mound, down the mound. And at the last second, he's able to pop, fire the hips open. So right here, he's completely coiled. He's holding that coil, he's holding that coil. He's holding that coil. You can see his lead leg is trying to maintain that coil. He's still pointing the bottom of the shoe at the catcher, holding the coil. Now he begins to unload it, very last second. And that's when he lands from above. We like to talk about uh, this idea of as you unleash and rotate down into landing, a lot of hard throwing pitchers, they land from above. They don't scoot into landing, but it's a rotational unload down into the lead leg. And so that's where you see what we call the step over move. Uh, Paul Nyman coined that term originally, but it kind of looks like he's stepping over a box. He just does that, does this in a more exaggerated way than most pitchers do. Boom, right here. Landing from above, accepting force on that lead leg. And you can see how the hips go from just about fully closed, four frames earlier. One, two, three, four. Popping the hips open last second into landing. So again, this brings up the point of some pitchers will try to clear the hips as early as possible. Their first move is to just try to open up the hips or reach open with the lead leg. What most of the hardest throwers in the world do, and again, he's, a, he's kind of an outlier, an exaggeration with, with type, his hip type, is they're holding this incredible pelvic coil. Shohei Otani is another great example. They're holding this pelvic coil as long as they can. They're building tension, they're riding it down the mound, they're popping it open at the very last second. And you'll see this in uh, hitters as well, power hitters who have internal rotation hips, again, like an Otani, like a Bryce Harper. This is just a very powerful strategy of loading the hips. So what happens when he does finally get to that critical point where he does allow the hips to release and pop open into landing, what well, he's able to get from, you know, the belt facing uh, shortstop or third base to clearing the hips to maybe around, let's say 45 degrees open at landing. Uh, there's a misconception sometimes that you need to get the hips completely square to the target at landing. Uh, what actually happens is you're, you know, most hard throwing pitchers are somewhere in that 40, 45, 50, 55 degree range where the hips are, you can say cleared, but there's still room for the lead leg to actually accept force. So from this point right here, he's now reached front foot weight bearing. This front foot just accepted force. Here's that position of the hips from there. Again, open, but not completely open, right? The hips aren't here yet. The hips are about 45 degrees. And so now that impulse from the lead leg helps accelerate the pelvis and complete that pelvic rotation. Again, about 45 degrees open, front leg hits, pushes back on this side of the pelvis, propels the hips 
completes and finishes that pelvic rotation, then you get a very strong decel and that energy is sent all the way up the chain in kind of this tornado like, uh, uh, this tornado of energy that rotational torque flows up through the rest of the chain. So you need to be able to clear the hips to some extent without landing completely open to be able to actually accept that horizontal ground reaction force off the lead leg, get a good block and be able to transfer the energy up through the spine and ultimately get it out and around into the arm. So again, you can see this is a great example of the paw back mechanism in action. So as that force is sent back into the pelvis, pelvis rotates and that lead leg is then pulled into extension as the hips complete their rotation. And again, just very, very good example, propels the upper half out over the lead leg and he gets this crazy extension out front as a result. What you see in guys who the lead leg kind of uh, collapses a little bit is they never actually get to that point of maximum extension because the lead leg kind of collapses, their body loses that kind of stability and they end up releasing somewhere around here. Whereas if they get that full paw back mechanism, they can release all the way out front. So having a really effective uh, lead leg is actually anecdotally from us working with pitchers, the guys with a better lead leg blocks, typically they're able to get that last little bit of extension out front, those last few inches versus when they kind of land in a soft knee bend and everything kind of collapses right here. So again, that's another contributing factor to how he's able to create such outlier extension. The other piece that I wanted to mention in regards to that extension has to do with this idea of creating propulsion off the rubber. So I talked before about uh, triple extension, like jumping off the rubber and how that can commonly be a uh, detrimental uh, feature in amateur athletes mechanics, amateur pitchers mechanics, when they are kind of cued to just push off the rubber as hard as they can, they end up landing in a fully extended position. The problem when you get into that fully extended position is you don't have as much room in your hip to actually rotate from. It ends up being a very linear lower half versus being able to have enough slack to actually rotate the hips and get the energy into the upper half. So again, pitching is not really a, a linear car crash. It's not a jumping off the back leg, extending, and then car crashing off the lead leg. It's actually more of a rotational move. But there are some pitchers who can create a ton of propulsive force off the rubber without getting stuck in this fully extended position. So he's so up-tempo, he's got a really aggressive drift, he's able to capture this overall kind of loop of energy, ride it forward, ride the lower half forward, deep hinge, loaded position, forward torso, holding hip internal rotation. And we can see right here, this is where the rubber is. Such a powerful unload from the hips that his back foot is pulled maybe eight, 10 inches off the rubber. So just because of how dynamic and explosive and athletic his lower half is, he's actually getting that additional kind of explosion off the rubber. It's almost like he's leaping without getting stuck in full, full extension off the back leg. So you can see there's still some slack here. He still has a little bit of knee flexion at this point. He's still getting that back, back foot turned over. He's still rotating very well. So it's not just jumping off the rubber with his quad, but he's creating such uh, explosive propulsion off the rubber while still being able to rotate out of that. Um, this is where he's getting that extra, let's say eight inches of extension. And then again, because of that effective lead leg block, allowing him to release the ball uh, way out here as well. So just being able to look at kind of the crazy, that's, that's his like seven foot three extension right there if we look at it start to finish. It's a combination of the powerful explosive lower half and the really effective lead leg block. Let's take a look now at the, the throwing arm. Right, we spent a lot of time focusing on what the rest of the body is doing. Not that the arm isn't important, but that if you screw up the start of the throw, if you screw up the rest of the body, screw up your posture, um, your arm is just not gonna be in a great spot to ultimately transmit that energy through the rest of the body, transmit the energy out into the ball. So he's able to create a massive amount of rotational torque. He's able to, to rotate that into, into landing. He's able to get a good lead leg block, send that energy up through his pelvis, create dissociation, create that hip shoulder separation, create that stretch, then send it into the torso. And at this point, his arm is in a position to accept uh, that layback and to accept that rotation and be able to actually transmit out and around to the ball. Now, he's actually a guy we go to comparing him across years. This is another one of the trade-offs we've kind of touched on right here. The more upright of a torso posture, typically 
the more on time the arm will be, the more bent over, the more hunched over the torso posture. Again, it becomes more difficult to get that arm up, back, and on time. And so we can see that kind of change over time. Arm up here, arm up here. As he begins to get kind of tipped forward, the arm finds more of a uh, kind of, I wouldn't call that necessarily late because we kind of define late somewhere around 45 degrees or lower external rotation. So if he's somewhere around here at landing now, if he was like stuck down here at landing, that might be considered late. He's like just at the point where I would consider that still on time. But again, it is interesting how that really does follow the position of the torso. So if you're able to be a little bit more upright, typically those guys can access their thoracic spine a little bit better from here versus when they're stuck down here. They can access their scap to actually tilt behind them when they're a little bit more upright. The arm is gonna be a little bit more up and in external rotation at landing as well. So again, pros and cons. Um, some guys have the mobility to get out of this position and make it work. He obviously does. We'll talk about that in a second. Other guys, you know, when they start dumping forward like this, their velo might tank. They might start getting shoulder pain because their scap can't get in a good position. Their T-spine can't get in a good position to accept that layback. So he is somewhat of an exception in terms of his ability to actually throw harder from this position. In my experience as kind of a low slack guy, having, you know, been into the upper 90s before, you know, I've, I've been all through different slots in my career. You know, I've been somewhere around here. I've also at times been down here where he kind of is right now. Over my own career, over working with other athletes with lower slots, there's typically a sweet spot somewhere in this range. So let's say, let's say this is kind of the range, right? This is the range for low slot guys. Usually there's a sweet spot somewhere in there where they can demonstrate their best velos, their arm feels the best, they're in plane, they can command the ball the best. It's fairly uncommon that this part of the range is where their best velo is, this part right here, this very bottom end of the range. Um, something about getting below parallel with the torso versus being able to still stay at least parallel and get downhill through the ball like a DeGrom or Max Scherzer. Typically that's where most guys will perform the best around that slot or a little bit higher if they're gonna be a low slot guy. So he again is a little bit unique in the fact that he's throwing 102, um, actually if anything, a little bit below sidearm. Just very uncommon from what I've seen. Usually it's gonna be somewhere in kind of one of, one of these two slots where guys perform best. One of the questions I got was, are Edwin Diaz mechanics teachable? And if yes, like why isn't this being taught? So why aren't uh, coaches teaching guys to throw like Edwin Diaz if this is such an effective way to throw? I've kind of addressed this question before in a different way when uh, talking about Tim Lincecum, where you know, we can all think back to, you know, when everyone was trying to throw like Tim Lincecum or, you know, whatever pitcher of the year was, you know, he was the guy everybody was trying to throw like and imitate. But it becomes really difficult when those types of guys have very outlier qualities or characteristics in their bodies or in their mechanics. So again, we've already talked about, he's a guy with a very forward tilted posture. Most guys without the T-spine mobility, um, you know, without the shoulder mobility, aren't gonna be able to get out of this position nearly as well because you just aren't able to access the thoracic spine nearly as well. You're not able to tilt the scap. You're not able to get out of such a forward tip posture nearly as well. Um, he's also cross body. So you can see how cross body he is right here. Again, not a problem in and of itself. It just makes him a little bit unique. And some guys can make that work. We've seen it time and time again. Certain guys, if they come to us, they're throwing well, they're throwing hard, they're not having pain, their lead leg works well, cross body. It's not something we necessarily will change. But to throw cross body, to get in this position, it does take more hip internal rotation to be able to brace from that position. When you end up so cross body here, to be able to get the hips back online, you just need better mobility in that lead hip. And he's able to almost like uh, posteriorly displace that left hip and really, really get into that left hip as he completes that rotation. So again, something that's just gonna be difficult if your hip structure, your anatomy is not like his. If we look at the pelvic load, which we talked about, I mean, he's getting at least 45 degrees of internal on the back leg with the pelvis. He's showing at least 45 degrees of hip internal on the lead leg in open chain here. Um, if you don't have this type of hip internal rotation mobility, which you know, 
I would say maybe 10 to 15% of the athletes we evaluate have this type of hip IR. Like it's not that common. Then again, th trying to throw like this will not work for you and your body's not gonna move like this no matter how hard you try to resemble Edwin Diaz. So just to summarize, like you don't have probably his hip IR. It's unlikely you have his shoulder external rotation. It's unlikely you have his T-spine mobility and his T-spine rotation as well. So it just goes to show we need to be careful who we necessarily try to emulate. And if you are gonna pick a mechanical comp from the MLB, making sure it's somebody with a similar type of body structure, arm slot, height, wingspan, et cetera, et cetera, to you, so that you actually have some sort of a kind of end goal of like, okay, this guy actually somewhat relates to how my body can move. Maybe this is a good guy to use to learn from, to try to figure out what he does to be successful. But for most of you, Edwin Diaz is just a really cool kind of case study to learn from rather than somebody you should necessarily go and try to emulate. So what are some other reasons that he's able to throw so hard besides just, you know, loading his hips really well, his arms in plane, you know, on time, a good, good lower half, good lead leg block. What are some other reasons why he's able to do it um, despite other guys, you know, having efficient quote unquote mechanics, not throwing 102 miles an hour. Uh, a big piece of it, again, is genetics. Uh, he's an extremely fascia driven, uh, reactive, explosive athlete. Uh, if you haven't heard me talk about kind of the, the difference here, uh, a good example would be thinking of like a Kevin Durant versus a LeBron James. So you have the very like springy, uh, tendon driven athletes, and then you have more like muscle driven uh, athletes in terms of how they prefer to produce force. Um, he's not a super muscular, super jacked guy, you know, who's always in the weight room showing feats of strength, but he's not Noah Syndergaard in terms of how he produces his power. He's relying on this you know, fast twitch nature, he's relying on his uh, internal elastic components of his fascial system, his tendons, uh, to be able to really act as a complete like tornado-like whip. Um, I talked about this in the Tristan McKenzie breakdown. Again, another example of a guy who's fairly lean, wiry, skinny, and just has an absolutely electric, fast, quick arm. So in terms of that, there is some genetic component to how you tend to prefer to produce your power. So he's got extremely efficient fascial system. He's utilizing end ranges of motion. He's accessing all the stretch shortening cycle and the elastic properties of his, his pec, his obliques, everything through his entire system. He's maximally utilizing and stretching that rubber band in terms of how he throws. He's also got long levers, listed at 6'3". I'd be shocked if he didn't have at least you know, a 6'5 plus wingspan. Uh, obviously very lean, and I would imagine, um, despite his kind of wiry uh, look, probably very uh, explosive in the weight room. Even if his absolute strength isn't super high, I'd be willing to bet he can throw medicine balls very well, and he can do a lot of these uh, more power-based movements uh, very effectively. Just like how a Chris Sale isn't necessarily super strong, but would still likely excel in a lot of kind of fast twitch, um, more speed-based movements in the weight room. And then the other point to make too, is that he's been throwing with some version of these mechanics his entire life. So although they have kind of evolved over time, he's taken some degree of efficiency in his patterns and slowly honed that and honed that and honed that and honed that and honed that over time to where he's gotten today, to being the most efficient, timed up, synced up version of those mechanics possible. If you or I go and suddenly try to throw like Edwin Diaz tomorrow, not only is it not gonna work because we don't have the same body type, structure, mobility necessarily to do that, but we haven't spent decades and tens of thousands of reps slowly honing and coming onto that you know, ideal combination of movements and establishing that as the absolute ideal for ourselves. So any one of us you know, might do better with more upright torso posture, with less hip IR, with the arm a little bit more upright on time. Right? There's a lot of different variables and these mechanics have survived the decades of trials as the ones that have emerged as the most effective and efficient for him. Whereas for you, it's gonna be different. For another pitcher, it's going to be different. So um, again, decades and decades of reps to evolve into these mechanics. It's why you can't just go emulate a big league pitcher and expect to have any sort of similar results, obviously, um, you know, in such a short time frame. The last thing I really want to touch on, uh, because some people asked about it, is comparing Edwin to his brother, Alexis. Um, now, you guys have probably seen this side by side before. I think, uh, I think Pitching Ninja has posted it before. Um, but it's pretty striking how similar they throw to each other. Now we have worked with a number of siblings. We've worked with twins who both threw in the upper 90s or 100 miles an hour. And there are usually a lot of similarities between siblings, obviously between twins, but even between siblings in terms of how their just general body structure is built, how they move. And how you move on the mound is in large part going to be constrained and dictated by 
the available mobility, your lever lengths, et cetera, et cetera. Not to mention the actual environment uh, through which you learn to throw. So they might've grown up, probably grew up playing catch together, long tossing together. I don't, I don't know exactly what their training looked like, but they definitely grew up um, throwing with each other. And so it's not surprising to see the similarities here. However, that being said, whenever we do work with siblings or twins, even with twins, you see typically one of them throws two or three miles an hour harder than the other. And you'll see some sort of minor inefficiency in the one who throws slower because they're dealing with very similar body types or identical body types, but one just maybe doesn't have the exact same mechanical uh, sequencing or smoothness or efficiency as the other. So could that be why, you know, Alexis is a 95, 98 guy, whereas Edwin is a 98 to 102 mile an hour guy. So first off, the leg lift is very, very similar. They're both lifting high. They're both getting the glove up uh, above the chest. What's interesting from this point is we talked about how Edwin really coils into his lower half. He really uses that coil of the pelvis and that holding internal rotation on the lead leg as a way to stay closed, build tension, and then pop it open in the last second. You don't see that in Alexis. So he's loading into more of what I would call an external rotation dominant load. You can see his lead leg is already clearing, lead foot already clearing. Whereas Diaz, he's still trying to show the bottom of his cleats towards the catcher. So less of an internal rotation position, more of an external rotation position relatively. And so he's not doing, uh, again, what we refer to as possibly Edwin Diaz's like secret sauce. He's not really getting into this, really holding and delaying pelvic rotation, holding tension there and unloading it at the last second. He still gets the hips open into landing. He still appears to be rotating the hips well. And honestly, his arm is getting into a better flip up position. So if we go to this point right here, he's getting his arm up and back, definitely a little bit more on time than Edwin Diaz. However, simply as a result of um, not loading and unloading the pelvis nearly as powerfully, uh, I believe this is likely where he's potentially losing a little bit of velo as, as compared to Edwin. Again, assuming that they have similar levers, assuming that uh, they have similar strength metrics, right? They should be able to throw a little bit closer and below than they actually are. So assuming all these things, that could be where some of the velocity differential is coming from. The other thing, which Alexis, uh, he doesn't keep his head back into landing nearly as well. So as he moves down the mound, not only is he kind of opening up early with the lead leg, with the pelvis, but he's also tipping that front shoulder downhill a little bit early as well. This can work for some guys. I want to reiterate that. It's hard to say what is absolutely better in every single case, but if you're gonna use Edwin as kind of maybe maybe the gold standard for him, and he wants to know why he's not throwing as hard as Edwin, the other piece could be head leaking forward over the front side. Two suggestions for him possibly could be being able to hold the head back into landing, be able to delay the pelvis a little bit longer. And that could explain why his lead leg is not necessarily working as well as Edwin. That could explain the two, three, four mile an hour lower velo that he's showing. But all in all, really cool to see how similar they are, both getting into the upper 90s or above, both playing at the big level. Pretty cool to see more similarities than differences between the two of them. So a couple of closing thoughts. Um, as I was going through this, as I was researching for this video, as I was prepping, um, you know, obviously you can't avoid the fact that Edwin Diaz has one of the coolest walk-up songs in the big leagues. So I wanna know from you guys, if we're gonna compare Edwin Diaz and his walk-up to Mariano Rivera, one of the best walk-up songs of all time, Enter Sandman. What do you guys prefer? What do you guys think is the better walk-up song? And then we actually kind of take it another step further. Do you think that Edwin Diaz can potentially be as good as Mario Rivera over the course of his career? So do you think he has a potential to be a Hall of Famer? Who would you take right now in their prime as far as the better closer? I'm curious to hear what you guys think down below. But I just found it interesting. Both of them started off as starting pitchers in the minor leagues. Both of them kind of had these, you know, something quirky, something unique about them. Mariano was trying to figure out why his ball kept cutting and then eventually just said, I'm just gonna lean into what makes me not a liar, lean into what makes me unique. And that led to him being one of the best relievers of all time. Edwin Diaz, funky, herky-jerky, a little bit different, a little bit different release height. Again, leaning into what makes him different, leaning into his outlier qualities and really flourishing once they got to the bullpen versus being in more of a starter role. So just cool to see some similarities there. Uh, cool to see uh, you know, how successful Edwin Diaz has been. And again, it's it's important to note, like, even big leaguers have room to improve, right? Two years ago, if you had said, could Edwin Diaz throw even harder? Could he be even better? I mean, I don't know how many people would have said yes, 
just like DeGrom, three years ago, if you said, could DeGrom come back and be sitting three miles an hour harder than he is right now, there's always room to get better, no matter what level you're at. These guys just continually up their game on a routine basis, and I just can't wait to continue watching him throughout the rest of his career. Hope you guys found that video helpful. Thanks for watching. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Hit that thumbs up and let me know down in the comments below what breakdown you would like to see me do next. I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.